Hello and welcome to Republican Roundtable. I'm your guest host, Jennifer Zielinski. I'm subbing in for Max Reimer, he has the night off. And we are deep in the 2022 election season. In fact, we have less than two months left to the general election voting day, election day. With us today, we do have three great guests. We have Sean Holster, Doug Fulton, Ryan Chase, all running in the South Metro area. And one thing we like to ask you guys first is, who are you and why are you running for office? And I'll start with Sean. Uh, well, my name is Sean Holster. I am running for State Senate in District 63, South Minneapolis. I uh, decided to run for office because uh, as a resident of South Minneapolis, um, I have become very concerned with the direction that the state of the city has fallen in public safety uh, and any number of other livability issues, basically, that uh, we, can, we can turn this around. It's a, it's a policy thing, and that's where we're falling down. Doug. Hi. I'm Doug Fulton, and I'm running for Senate District 50, which represents Edina and Bloomington. My wife, Cindy, and I um, have lived in Edina for 22 years. We've raised our four children there. And I, I've become more and more frustrated over the last couple of years. And when I saw the, the, um, the school closing, closings that took place during the pandemic, the burning of Precinct 3 in Minneapolis, and when I saw last year's legislature not be able to give back to the taxpayers an overcollected $9 billion of tax money. Um, and the last straw for me was um, when I learned this spring that the Democrats were, were endorsing my opponent who um, has only lived in Edina for less than a couple of years. Um, it just felt to me like, you know, this was the time to get in this race and try and return this district seat back to the Republican Party. Thank you. And Ryan. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us, Jen. Uh, Ryan Chase, I'm running in 49A, which is um, Eden Prairie, north of Highway 5, up to Minnetonka, south of Highway 7. Um, we've lived in Eden Prairie, right on the Minnetonka border, for about the last six years. Before that, we were in West Bloomington for about 10 years. Um, my two sons, five and eight, you know, we're, we're deep into the community and just really enjoying our quality of life that Eden Prairie has to offer. Um, you know, when I, I ran the Twin Cities Marathon in 2017, I did all my running around the neighborhood. I mean, it's just a wonderful place that's been safe. Um, clean, enjoyable, great neighborhoods, great neighbors. Um, and so what we've seen over the last couple of years, like Doug was saying, there's been a lot of changes and I don't think we have the policies in place. We don't have the leadership in place. Um, and from my experience in business, is, you know, that's, that's my background where I'm coming from. Um, you really need to have a plan and I don't feel like there's been a plan in place. Um, so I feel like I'd be a great candidate to, to get into the, you know, the House of Representatives um, for my district to be able to make those quality policy changes. Well, thank you guys for being on the show today and joining us. Um, I think one of the major issues we have seen across the Twin Cities, um, and it's no, you know, no news to anybody, but crime has risen. Um, we have Sean from Minneapolis, representing Minneapolis, probably the heart of where it's all happened, the Minneapolis Third Precinct, but we've seen it spread into Edina, um, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. Uh, Doug, I'll start with you. Would you like to talk about some of the issues you've seen and how you would address that as a state senator? Yeah, well, I, I want to point out that I've really spent 35 years in the real estate, commercial real estate business where I've, I've been in the business of helping represent companies as they um, work on transactions. So I have 35 years of working and negotiating tough deals uh, and also having the ability to um, develop relationships. And so I, I'm really excited about being able to take those skill sets into the legislature. In our district, Edina and Bloomington, we, we've had a big impact uh, uh, from, from crime. Um, a lot of the crime that has happened in Minneapolis has pushed out into Edina and into Bloomington. Um, and when I talk to people uh, in the district, they, they're nervous. They're, they're nervous and their families are impacted um, on decisions they're making. They're, they're not going downtown Minneapolis um, mm -hmm. like they used to. They're reluctant to go down um, to do date nights. They're, they're, they're worried about having cars stolen at night. They're making sure their garages are down. They're worried about their kids when the, when, when the, um, in, in the evening. So it has really affected the families from a quality of life perspective. Um, and when we understand that you know, the way that we get back to sort of normalcy is to be able to su support the police mm -hmm. and try and help them create um, and have, have enough resources in, in, in their ranks so that they can help protect these neighborhoods. 
And Ryan, this is one of your topics too that you've been addressing on your campaign, correct? It is, yeah. And I think for Eden Prairie and the Southwest Metro specifically, um, what we've been hearing from a number of you know chiefs of police is that the residents really get along and appreciate their police officers. Um, and the officers are well respected in the community. And I think that's wonderful. I mean, that's there's nothing more that you could ask for for that area. But the problem that we're having is that so much of the crime has spilled out from other towns and cities. Um, and, you know, if they're stealing cars and they bring them out to the suburbs, um, they commit crimes out there. And that's, that's why this is a state issue. And I think that's why, you know, we look at this as one of our priorities um, because we are looking to be at the state level to figure out this from a state level perspective. Um, for me, I think it's, it's a lot of looking at how do we get Minneapolis to get the officers that they need again because they're so understaffed right now um, that they need that support. They need some kind of a fix that's going beyond just their own control and support. I know the state patrol is working Fridays and Saturdays with Minneapolis, getting more people on the streets down there to build those relationships again. Uh, but we need to do more because we've been losing a lot of police and peace officers um, from that p profession. Um, we need to remind people that it is an honorable profession. Um, it's something that we do need and that people do appreciate the police. There are a few that are making a lot of noise saying that the police aren't doing their jobs. But the reality is most of us do believe that the police are a fantastic resource um, and support for our communities. And that's what we need to do at the state level is remind everybody that the police are on our side. Um, but we do need to, you know, maybe have a little bit of reform. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there are issues that we've seen, mm -hmm. um, but we need to get policing back front and center to make our, our community safe again. And Sean, you live in Minneapolis. You've seen probably ground zero of everything going on, including your police precinct burning down two years ago. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it, it, one of the motivators to run was, was seeing um, DFL's candidates stance on policing and defunding the police abolishing the police uh, most recently reading something about her stance on um, uh, eliminating cash bail mm -hmm. uh, I, I look at these policies and I say this is ludicrous you cannot reform policing by cutting budgets by reducing staffing um, if if you want a more effective police force and we have a opportunity to be a model not just a model of riots and social decay, but of rebuilding what effective reform looks like. And that's gonna cost money. It doesn't, it's not gonna involve taking money away to get a higher degree of training and proficiency in not only range time, but uh, various uh, conflict de-escalation techniques, uh, much like mental health professionals have continuing education requirements that you know, it isn't another degree or mm -hmm. anything, but it is a continual training, uh, continual education. And that takes time, that takes money, and that takes will. And that's going to have to come from the state level because apparently the, the will is not there on the city level, unfortunately. Yeah, unfortunately what we've seen. And do you gentlemen see any other ways to address the crime issue that we have seen across uh, in the Twin Cities and just spreading into the suburbs like nothing has before. Well, I think it, it, it really, um, Ryan really talked about it. I mean, part of what we need to do is we need to get Minneapolis stabilized. Yes. So once we get our urban core um, with a security level that sort of allows the, the job creators, the occupiers to start being com comfortable going back into downtown and, get, and, and bringing more employees back downtown, then we'll start to sort of stabilize and that'll have a positive impact on, on, on all the surrounding communities. But Sean is right, it's gonna take a lot of money. It's gonna take uh, the ability to be able to provide lots of resources to law enforcement to be able to do training, be able to do some recruiting, some, some creative recruiting and, and find a workforce that maybe, you, that maybe that wasn't in the channel before for going into law enforcement. Um, but we've got we've to gotta over-resource in the next you know, two, three, four years in order to make sure that we set the trajectory of Minneapolis back mm -hmm. on the right path because we are all in this. All of our communities are in this to make sure that um, we, we get the, our families feel safe in our communities and we partner with police um, in order to get our worlds back to normal. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just just shortly, I think that's absolutely right. If we start from the heart of where some of the problems are, um, and I think, again, there is some reform to be done and additional training. I think that's very much of what the problem is, is de-escalation. And, um, you know, whether we're going to be calling something somebody a, a different title um, than they currently are today, we need those people there. We need um, more people in that profession um, that are caring. Um, mm -hmm. I just went on a, a ride along with a state trooper last week, and it was fascinating because, you know, the support that they get is great. Um, but every department is different. And mm -hmm. what I really love to see is Minneapolis having that same high quality of ethics and morals and, and thought uh, and compassion, consideration for what the results they're trying to get. Safer streets is what they're trying to get. Um, and I think that's, that's really where we need to focus is, is making a plan, like Doug was saying, getting more people in there, um, getting them the training that they need so that we can stabilize things. Because again, it, it does reach out into all the communities. It's not just the suburbs. It's around and, the And getting state. back to being, you know, a, 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 instead of being a reactive uh, policing, being back to being proactive. Right. Because mm -hmm. um, when you're proactive, you're able to do so many more effective things. Yep, exactly. Well, and right now we have police just responding call to call. You know, we see the um, defunding that's happening in Minneapolis with just low staffing, but it's carrying across the, you know, many other police departments where they're just not feeling that appreciation, but now we just have police responding to call to call, and we, ha we see the results of that, unfortunately, where we do see increase in thefts, increase of the carjacking thing that has been going on across the Twin Cities. It's not local to Minneapolis or local to a certain part of the city, it's across the Twin Cities at this point. Right. Well, and now to the degree that uh, if it's a property crime, the police aren't responding. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. And uh, anecdotal, uh, just heard a story today of someone who called 911, didn't get an answer, and called back three, four times. No response from 911, not, not even picking up the phone. <laughs> this, this is not right. This, this is not acceptable. That's scary. And, and this is all a result of policy, straight up. One other major issue we have seen um, across the country and even local to the state is the economy. We have uh, inflation going on where we're seeing our budgets go towards our groceries, go towards our gas. Um, Ryan, I'll start with you. You do have a background in business and accounting, as I recall, correct? Right. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up because that's really where um, it surprises me that we don't have a plan. Mm -hmm. um, a year and a half, two years ago, uh, the rest of the accounting department and I, we'd have discussions and we'd say, okay, we know inflation's coming. What are we doing to plan for this? And meeting with directors and you know the vice presidents to figure out what their budgets are, mm -hmm. knowing that this is going to be a problem. And it was a hiring issue back then. Um, now we have, like you said, the inflation issue mm -hmm. where because we don't have people coming back to work, we're still missing around 65,000 people in the workforce from pre-pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. um, we're paying everybody more. Things are costing more. It's costing more to bring it in. Um, you know, we've, I think we've all heard stories of friends or, you know, people when we're out the doors, knocking on doors, they don't know if they should be eating meat this week. They don't know if they can afford it. They don't know, you know, filling the car up. Um, yeah, it's great the gas is coming down, but it's still significantly higher than it was just a couple years ago. So those are all issues that need a plan. And I think that's what you're hearing up here, whether it's a public safety issue or the economy. We need a plan, and we're not hearing a plan. You know, mm -hmm. we hear um, an Inflation Reduction Act that has nothing to do with inflation. We need to point to the problem, figure out what we can do about it, and then act on it. And and we can do it at the state level. This isn't just a, a national issue, a global issue. This is a state issue as well. And mm -hmm. when we have legislators that are pushing, you know, 20 cent gas taxes and other <laughs> spending things, um, we know that's a problem. And right now, Minnesotans cannot afford those increases. They need money back. We have a $9 billion budget. Um, I think, you know, people are wondering what's going on with it. Well, there's no plan. There, there isn't a plan, and there were discussions on what to do with it, but I think if I had, you know, access to it, which I hope I do, um, that's where I'd say we need to cut it back. Uh, Minnesota is one of the worst. I think it's top five worst tax states in the country. Uh, we can do better than that. We, you know, giving, giving part of that surplus back, I think would go a long ways to the residents to be able to pay for their groceries, pay for their gas, and go see family members for Thanksgiving and Christmas because we're not out of the woodwork yet. It's, it's continuing to get worse and we need to do something about it now.
Yeah, and that's what I'm really fearing coming, you know, the winter. Is this going to increase? Is this going to decrease? Where are we going? And Sean, what's your take on the economy? And as a state senator, how are you going to help address that? What do you see the issues are? I see the issue as bringing business back to Minnesota. Regulatory and tax policy has been driving business out of Minnesota for a very long time. Big business, and now the last couple of years, small business has been decimated by any number of factors. So what can we do on the state level? Well, let's uh, knock down some of those barriers into starting a business, um, reduce some of the tax burden of operating a business, knock down some of the regulatory burdens and permits <laughs> and uh, renewals that small business people, uh, even down to the, the lowly individual handyman driving his pickup truck around. Uh, how many different permits, licenses, um, hoops to jump, regulatory hoops to jump through just to be able to swing a hammer to build somebody a front stoop. So, uh, and apply that across the board. I mean, there's, there's no reason to maintain this hostile business climate that Minnesota has become on, mm -hmm. on every level. Mm -hmm. it's, it's frustrating. Exactly, and if there's not a reason to stay here, you know, why are we going to have businesses that do stay? How, how, how do we attract business by being hostile in every shape, form, and fashion? And Doug, you have an impressive background um, in real estate and building those relationships. How are you going to use your role as a state senator to start to turn our economy around, turn that ship around? Well, I think I think uh, Ryan and, and Sean have hit, hit on the main points about mm -hmm. you know the, the issues we have and in, in, with inflation and the high cost of being in Minnesota. You know, at the bottom line, Minnesota's got to get back to being a place that attracts people, that attracts workers, that attracts companies. And one of the challenges we have today is that because of our regulatory environment and because of our tax structure, one of the highest in the country with, with, with personal property taxes, as Ryan talked about, one of the highest with corporate, um, corporate taxes and commercial real estate taxes, is that we, we push a lot of businesses out, out of Minnesota Mm -hmm. when they go to um, invest in new resources and new facilities and new investments. And, and with our residents, we, we continue to lose a lot of people because of our tax structure. So we, we really have got to focus on trying to bring our personal income tax down so that we don't lose all these people that because of our tax structure are moving out. We've lost 34,000 people from Minnesota in the last eight years, 20,000 in the last two years. And, and these, are, these are residents, neighbors who are saying, look, I, I can go to another state that's warmer in the winter time than Minnesota, <laughs> and I can save money in taxes. And it's just not people who've sold their companies or who have a lot of money. We're losing a lot of young people too, who are graduating from high school or have gone to college and have moved back and, and, and say, you know what, I'm looking around the, the, the country and there are cities like Charlotte and Austin and Nashville that um, have lower income taxes than we have here. And my friends have moved there. It's a great place to live. So we've got to, Minnesota's got to, it, it got, to got to grab this moment and keep, keep our people uh, here and look for ways to create policy and tax policy that doesn't force them out. Well, thank you for that. And does anyone have anything else they would, you know, do as a representative or a state senator to start to turn that economy um, with the gas tax? Yeah, I think uh, the gas tax is a big thing. Um, we have one of the highest gas taxes in the country as we our tax policy across the board is that way. Mm -hmm. um, getting people back to work, I think, is the big thing for me. Um, back in the workforce, giving them, you know, a purpose, um, and and you know, building those relationships again. Um, you know, as Sean was saying, the regulatory issues that Minnesota has come up with are just forcing people to stay home, to to get out of work, to do other things, and it's not helping anybody. Um, the the shutdowns and, and mandates that were pushed the last two years were just incredible, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think any of us could have imagined um, that happening. And I think, you know, that's another big reason why I t decided to step up because, you know, we, we gave the governor authority for so long and the House kept, you know, voting down, taking that away. We need to be legislators. We need to talk. We all have great ideas. We have, <laughs> and, and, and that's what you're asking for, right? Additional mm -hmm. ideas. There are so many potential ideas out there. Let's get them all on the board, prioritize what's going to make the biggest impact, and let's go for that. Um, you know, getting people back to work, 
tax reductions, I think those are the two big ones for me, but I'm certainly open to anything at this point because uh, we are losing businesses, we're losing people, um, and it's only gonna make the, the economy a little bit worse you know, each time that somebody leaves or, leaves or a business leaves. Mm -hmm. So let's get them back to work, let's get them back in the state, um, and let's be friendly to, to our economical state. Well, and, and if I may, I, I, I can't help but think the best way to do that is to diminish the relationship between the citizen's wallet and, and the state by reducing redundancies, getting rid of redundancies, getting rid of the, the relationship between the wallet and the state, because then that puts the money back into the citizen's wallet to donate to charity, to start a business, to do with as they will to contribute to their community, strong individual, strong community, strong city, strong state. It's, it's a chain reaction that, okay, we reduce that interaction between the state and the citizen, allow activity to flourish, instead of inhibiting that, okay, we're in business, <laughs> we're rolling. I think one other topic we've really seen come up across the state is education. Um, we've seen Minneapolis schools just not performing at the same level, but again, just like the crime issue, we're seeing that carry out throughout the suburbs and throughout uh, greater Minnesota. Um, Sean, what are your thoughts on education and how are we going to work on that as a state senator? I would say open up education. Let the money follow the student, especially in the last couple of years we have seen how parents and the community will step up to find solutions when the public school system closes down or proves to be wholly inadequate. That the public school system as it stands, as a model, that we keep throwing good money after bad, it's an antiquated model that treats the student like a unit of production to be moved through, whether the quality is there or not. We are looking at anywhere between 35 and 47% proficiency in math, reading, and science mm -hmm. in Minneapolis public schools at the high school level. That, that's an F minus minus grade. That, mm. uh, how is this reasonable in any way? We are, if the only thing stopping parents from, and communities from exploring more alternatives, more options, more solutions, more effective solutions is okay, the funding, oh, it's going to the institution, it's going to the system, it's not following the student. If it follows the student, that experimentation, that, that incubator can mm -hmm. happen. So yeah, school choice, uh, vouchers basically. And Doug, um, you've seen the education in Edina just take a different change. Well, I think what you, when you look at Edina and Bloomington together, you know, Minnesota historically has had very good schools. Um, but Sean is right. The state of Minnesota continues to spend more and more money on public education. Um, it's over 40% of our general budget. Mm -hmm. And the results over the last 10 years have been in math and reading. The scores have been coming down, down, down every year. So somewhere either the teaching process has been changed, the culture has been changed, um, well, we've got to be able to give our teachers the tools and the resources to be able to get back to providing an excellent outcome. And I think Sean is right. The way you keep public school system competitive is that you provide families who are the best people to make the choice of where their kids should get educated, what, what kind of school they should be in. And we've seen the public school charter, the public school uh, charter school um, situation has, 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 has really exploded in the last few years. We've got almost 70,000 kids that are in charter schools today. And, and I've been surprised at the number of, of families that I have met over the last 100 days as we've been out walking neighborhoods that are teaching their kids at home. Mm -hmm. So you know what, the families have said, look, we're gonna take this education and teaching our kids into our, into our own responsibilities. And we're gonna find the right thing that fits, the, uh, the, the, the right education program that fits us. And, and, the, and the, the public school system has to, is gonna to have to be able to be competitive. I mean, it's all about outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so um, we gotta support our teachers. We gotta make sure our teachers are supported. We, you know, there's a shortage today of teachers. Mm -hmm. We need to encourage that as a profession. Um, but at the end of the day, it's our families that, that, that need to be making that decision. And Ryan, your thoughts on the education and how you're gonna accomplish that and take on that uh, as a state representative? Yeah, for me, I really need to look at the state level um, because Eden Prairie and Minnetonka schools 
have been toward the top of the state, and Hopkins is a great district as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not looking at the local level. It has to be because we're going for state level. It's a state view, and as we've been hearing, 42% is primary education, 7% of the general fund goes to secondary education. We should have better results on this, and because we're not, we really need to change something up. We've been seeing proficiencies dropping for the last decade, even mm -hmm. though every year, at least the three school districts in my area have continually, year after year, been better funded. And I'm glad that's happening. They need to be funded. We need those teachers in there um, because education is our future. But we're not getting the results that we need at the state level. We're seeing it dropping. We need to change something up. And so I do agree. I think school choice is a, you know, a fantastic place to start um, inside the city, outside the city, um, across the board. It's, it's something that will help us as a state get better with our kids and their, their education. Absolutely. And I'd like to thank you gentlemen for being on tonight's show. Uh, final question is going to be how can voters get a hold of you? And Ryan, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, just go ahead and go out to my website, please. Chaseformn.com. Uh, information out there, contact information. Um, you can get a hold of me that way as well. Very easy. Chase for MN. Exactly. Great. Good job. Way to set that example. <laughs> um, our website is FultonForSenate.com. And uh, on our website, we've got all of our priorities and our ideas for helping in each of these areas we've talked about tonight and others. Um, mm -hmm. And would appreciate people take, taking a look uh, at our campaign. Thank you. And Sean. Yes, I, I can be found at seanholster.com, S-H-A-W-N-H-O-L-S-T-E-R.com. That, uh, that will give you all of my policy positions, uh, as well as portals to the YouTube channel, uh, Facebook page, Twitter, uh, you name it, Substack. All that. All there. All right. And a bag of chips. <laughs> Well, thank you, gentlemen, again for being on Republican Roundtable. And it's hey, thank you. been a great yeah. interview with all of you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Republican Roundtable. Again, I'm Jennifer Zlinski. And just remember to get registered for the general election coming up here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.